So are you the kind of writer who is revising as you go along very heavily? Do you get the beginning perfect, move on to the next, get it? Or do you try to do it straight through in pouring big gulps and then come back? Right. I don't try to get everything perfect um, before I um, before I go on to the next thing, because then I would never go on to the next thing. I mean, there's infinite amounts of work that could go into that. Um, for me, the process of writing a novel in, in both uh, cases was a, a real sort of stuttering process at the beginning, where in the first 30 pages, there are just so many questions that as a writer you need to establish, you need to make a lot of decisions, right? What is the voice? What is the structure? What are you, what are you really trying to do? And so for this book, I wrote the first 50 pages at least three or four times trying to figure out what the book was and how I was going to proceed. Because you really can't, you know, if you don't know if you're writing in the first or the third person, you really, you can't write a whole book that way, right? And there's, and there's many other, you know, equally important decisions that you have to make, you know, in terms of distance and characterization. So I have to get that down. And then once I have that, I do try and write all the way through to a completed first draft, mainly as a mechanism for soothing my own insane anxiety, you know, about the writing process. Because I think it's so much more reassuring once you have a finished Draft, even if it's the worst draft ever, the fact that it exists as a concrete reality in the world um, is somehow uh, extremely reassuring. So I do that, and then I actually uh, start all over again with the second draft. But the first draft of writing a whole book is just sort of figuring out what the book is, and it's kind of messy and confused. And then you get to the end, and you're like, oh, that's who those characters are. That's what this book is about. And then for me, it doesn't work to go in and try and like change it in a Word document, right? It's, it's enormous to then go through and um, carry that vision into the second draft. So I start all over again, and I you retype the whole thing. I do retype the whole thing. Through it. Fortunately, I type very quickly, which <laughs> also dates back to my time as an editorial assistant. Uh, meaningful skills, fast typing. So anyway, and then I, I do the whole um, second novel, and that's when I would start to show it to people and then make um, revisions to that. And so I think the version that I showed to Gary was um, the first draft that he saw, but it was probably you're not starting entirely new for all four drafts. No, just the just the one. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, I'd have serious troubles on all So I, I think you answered my next question, which is that you, you don't change your process radically from writer to writer. You work more or less in the same way. Right? Yeah, I mean, everybody is writing. You know, I'm always. I never believe that there's a kind of book that's you know, books written by, by Alex are going to be books different from any other book. I mean, so the principle is the same, is you read as closely as you can and get into the, as an editor, you kind of get the spell of the book and figure out where the spell is being broken. So that, that works for everybody. Um, I couldn't imagine figuring out some left-handed way of editing this person and going back to right-handed with the other. Yeah. This re really is, the editing is just reading more closely and carefully than anybody you know, right behind. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, I mean, I think that's the obligation to have. And then what? You and Alex have been working on books together for a long, pretty long time now. Um, do you still, what is your role as champion of the book within your house? Do you have to do much of that or not? No, it's a huge part of the thing. It is. Yeah, we, every publisher publishes more books and can give far more money. Possibly get the amount of attention to make the so you fight all the time for your left. The editing part, and that's my job. I mean, that's yeah. step one. If you don't do it, you can fire. Um, step two is you have to win the building. You know, there's any number of phrases that you, you have to care deeply about that. Get the book read around the house. Come up with some idea. Because far too many books are published in this country for a tiny fraction ever be even remotely successful. You want to be in that remotely successful, you know, and that's, that's tough. And you learn 
And that differs from, it all starts with the book, though. You can't say to yourself, Christ makes you a kid. You know, I'm going to convince people this is it. Um, the book, you were allowing the book to speak for itself, but with the widest possible audience in the front row, really. And let it take, grab there, and then it spreads out. Um, it would be a great sales force, and I rely on our sales reps, and I rely on people in sales and marketing, and we're never totally Catholic. Because publishing is a, is a blue band product. It's not some fun old stuff. Uh, you can't dictate to people what they think about a book or what they're really going to like. You find the people who do like it, and then let them get to work. So that there's a, you know, throw one little pebble into a pond, that's great. It's a little ripple, and five seconds later, it's all over. But if you get a bunch of people from a handful of rocks, that's what you're trying to do. And once you have everyone in the house on board, and you've got a cover, and the book's gone to press, and, and your marketing team is really excited about it, do you find that there's a big difference in what you're required to do, or what your role as an author is in promoting the book? now, this year, as opposed to 2005? Well, 2005, um, back in the era of the dinosaurs, <laughs> there was no um, you know, emphasis on social media like there is today. And so that's the main difference. And I think it's an empowering difference for writers because it's something that uh, the author can actively engage in, in a way that we couldn't in is when it really was. Well, the marketing force, and they're either going to run an ad or they're not, and there's, I have no, like, say in that or no role in producing it, whereas I can get on Facebook, I can get on Twitter, I can do those things to try to help my own book, and I can try to sort of tap in the, to a national and even international community of readers in, in, in an instant, right? And that is completely different from what it was like in 2005. Uh, I, know, I asked you that because I noticed that when we do programming here, we're often approached and people say, oh, well, you should book this author because they tweeted six, they tweet 600 times a week. Or, okay. and, and, um, and so um, we try not to pay attention to that. But, but I, I imagine it is a factor even in, in, in everything you do. And so does that take a lot of time away from your writing? Or does it just come with the territory and you do it and, and you've managed to uh, well, I think it, it, it was probably hard to balance doing that with um, the sort of deep concentration involved in writing a book. But you know, for for writers, the time when your book comes out, you're so like beside yourself with you know stress and, and worry anyway that you might as well be wasting time on the internet. You know, you're not going to be so writing an excellent sonnet. You know, I just think it's like a completely different mindset, and it's a mindset of you know. A, a brief moment of extreme extroversion for the kind of person who is usually a deep, you know, introvert. So I, I sort of think, you know, it makes sense to sort of be out in the world with my book right now. Like, what, what other, you know, occasion is more valuable to me, you know, to um, spend time, you know, online or in person with people? Like, I'm more than happy to do it. I love to do it. Um, but then, you know, when it comes time to really be immersed in the next book, you know, I don't think I'll be on Twitter or Facebook all day long because those are sort of people. Well, I have a lot more questions to ask you, but I think there are probably people in the audience who want to ask a few questions. So maybe we should open it up if, if you do have questions in the audience, either about the writing process or about the relationship between author and editor. Um, or if you'd like to pitch your book. No, really, don't do that. Uh, yeah. Can I have a question? I mean, it's just, it's really, because um, of your experience, so I'm finishing an MFA and I haven't wrapped it enough. What advice, and I'm sure there's other people in a similar situation, what advice would you give to somebody who has finished, you know, over a period of four years or whatever, a large body of work and they're finishing an MFA? What, would, what advice would you give? Um, well, I think the first bit of advice that I would give, which I, I wish that I had been able to listen to myself, so I say this knowing that it's hard to um, to um, heed this advice, um, but my main thing is 
don't worry so much <laughs> and don't rush. Like I remember, you know, finishing my MFA and feeling there's all this feeling of like needing validation, needing to feel like you are a real writer with some kind of tangible proof of that out in the world. And you know, those markers are you know the, the graduate degree in writing and publication, right? So that's what we look for. And um, and of course, you know, I have both of those things, and I'm glad that I have them. But I don't think that you can go into them. Um, until you have written like the absolute best, you know, version of the thing that you've been working on. I think a lot of people just, like, the version of my novel that I wrote for my MFA thesis was like this kind of like hobbled little like clay baby version of <laughs> what eventually came out. It was like, you know, deformed and sad and, and measly. And I really, you know, if I had showed that to Gary at that time, I think he would have been like, oh, I'm not returning. <laughs> and um, but that was hard because I felt this intense pressure, you know, that all um, aspiring writers feel. So to wait until you have the very best version, you know, that you have, I guess, is the best um, thing that that I can say. And you know, I was lucky. I graduated and I had won some prizes and you know published stories in literary magazines and agents, you know, were starting to contact me that way. And I went through the very sort of traditional. In that sense of, of getting published, and I think that does still happen, but now there's even more sort of opportunities to network with agents you know, online and at festivals and various things. So um, once you once you do have the thing that you believe in, then you know, go ahead and, and find the agent and stand behind your work, and don't let the fact that people reject you um, shape that belief in your own work. I mean, this again is a truism, but it's completely um, a valid one that you only have to find the one person who falls in love with your work. And if nine agents don't fall in love with your work, that doesn't mean that your work is not good. It means that, you know, it's like it's a relationship between two people and they if they're gonna champion it, they have to fall in love. So keep sending it until you find that tenth person who does fall in love with your work. And it's true with agents and true with editors and I think ultimately it's true with the too. Other questions? Yeah. That's um, right in keeping with my question, which is um, for Gary, how have you seen the relationship? I mean, there's like legendary relationships between editors and writers, and some of them more intimate, and some of the editors more involved in shaping a writer than others. Have you, how have you seen that change in the time that you've been, um, I know you said you have a particular way of, of editing, and I don't know if that's changed at all since you started your career, but listening to other, other editors and, you know, how, how has that changed, do you think, over the course of the last like, 20 years? That's a good question. I mean, partly because it's easy to answer. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't changed at all. Right? Um, also because you can't know what it's such a private relationship. My best editor friend, I don't know what they're like. It could be, you know, I like to do a thing. I like to assume they're, they're fabulous, but they don't come to me and say, look at this. <laughs> Here's what I'm doing with so-and-so. I mean, it's a private conversation between the writer and the, and the editor. I mean, I know that my colleagues at Kanaf are extremely dedicated to it. How they go about it, I have no idea. I don't even care. Um, I've known really legendary people over the years. Fox, Bob Loomis, and Creed Good, and I knew a little bit how they would work, but they wouldn't even give me a, an edited manuscript and say, here kid, this is how you go about it, because I think they assume, quite rightly, that you figure your own way of going about it, because everybody's going to do it differently. Some people like long, boring memos on page 163, line 7. I don't understand what they're saying. Well, it's much easier for me just to go to, you know, on, on that line, think, what are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> so that hasn't changed. There's a lot of talk about editing. And, and observers will say, well, now editors have to produce so much volume, they're kind of assigned a number, and if you don't produce that number, and copies of the book cost $25 and so forth out of a job. I'd hate to work at any place that says that. Whether there are places that do, I don't know. It's not just one of them. Um, 
So, you know, business has changed a lot. I will testify to that. Since I came into it in 1977, it was a ghastly business, even more awful than it is now. <laughs> there have been periods of relief from that ghastliness. This doesn't seem to me to be one of them. <laughs> There's always something else to go wrong. And now it's e-books and all the rest of it is confusing the hell out of everybody, but you just keep your head down and keep working. So that hasn't changed. I mean, the conditions are always morphing in some weird new direction, or they're not morphing at all, they're just sort of dead. Um, but you just pretend they aren't dead. Um, and you would sort of, what Alex was saying, you know, you believe an editor's going to have any worth to believe it because we don't do any work. I mean, we're helping people to do work. Um, so you believe in your taste and, and you work as hard as you can to give that, give the talented people a shot. Um, and if that ever changes, then we're all done because it's essential. With any kind of work. I hope that yeah, it just, I seem to read books, though, that look like they haven't been edited very well now. And I've read some of those. I didn't know if that was the case 20 years ago, or it's a new phenomenon, or I don't know, but it's... There are lazy people of every age. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, on this business for Alex, I wanted to ask what one of the least of your inspirations was. I guess in terms of um, the novel and, and the inspiration, I had um, been reading a lot of what I thought were exciting novels that had uh, unusual structures, you know, um, books that move around a lot in time, uh, which is what I um, did in this book, and, and novels that seemed to me to break rules in ways that were interesting. So I had read, for example, like David Mitchell's book Cloud Atlas, which is you know, constantly starting over and over again with different characters and time zones and yet still managed to draw me in over and over again each time. And that was so exciting to me um, as a reading experience. And I thought, well, I'd, I'd like to you know, do something like that. I mean, that's how most of my writing starts, is wanting to imitate somebody else's work that I was very excited by. Um, and, and then I started thinking, well, actually, you know, this, this is an exciting thing in novels, but it's not necessarily a new thing. And, and looking back on um, sort of older books, I was thinking about um, To the Lighthouse, which is also written in in like three sections which jump around a lot in time and you get to sort of move in and out of um, characters' lives and see them at different moments in time. And that's, to me, very exciting as a reader because you get this completely different angle on a person's, uh, on a person's life. So those were two books that are sort of behind mine in terms of um, the structure and, and the influence. And then in terms of writing stories um, versus writing novels, um, I, I will say mainly that when I was writing this this book and its many drafts that I was uh, retyping, I would often uh, procrastinate um, because it wasn't going well and I was sort of you know, slogging through it and I was like, oh, I'm just going to take a break and for fun I'll stop and write a short story, you know, and because I think it was the it was the thing that I wasn't supposed to be working on, it was always really fun and exciting and quick, you know, you know that you could finish uh, a short story, so I would have like, oh, I'm going to take a little vacation and write a short story, and then I would go back to the novel and I would start going poorly again, and then I would come back and write another short story, so that's how I came to have, like, Pretty soon you have a I had a stack of short <laughs> stories that were my procrastination stories, so it's actually led me to uh, develop what I call like the decoy theory of fiction, that maybe we should all be writing like a crappy novel that we're supposed to be doing as our main and then you have the thing that you write while you're sort of on vacation that always seems sort of better and more fun. Um, except that, I except I'd, I'd add to that that I think it's easier to write a pretty good or even semi crappy novel than it is to write a collection of stories that are assigned to the authors. I mean, the novel gives you a little wiggle room. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Randall Gerald's famous definition of the novel is a, a prose work of a certain point. <laughs> a great many novels should fit that description. A great many really good novels with story 
before, he just don't really have much room for error. I mean, because the whole thing breaks apart. I mean, so I give Alan to consider the, it's not left handed, right? <laughs> unless you happen to be left handed. Right? Uh, you've worked with some incredible uh, short story writers, people who've written phenomenal Still do. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and you still do. Do you have a preference? What's more fun for you? Do you like working on story collection or do you like working on novels? Well, I mean, there's a, you can have a 20 page short story, five pages in there. <laughs> Four hours or something. <laughs> Eight hundred page novel. <laughs> so you know, it's the same kind of deal. Maybe I'll wait. I can have a book of stories on the go. And every so often, say, "My God, I'm gonna kill myself unless I can finish something." But no, it, it, it's all right. Yeah. We have time for two more questions. Anyone? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I remember you, well, I have two questions, but the first one. Uh, so when you s started and you had your fourth or fifth draft and you were looking for an editor, right? So uh, what has changed as far as what you're looking for an editor after you publish your two novels? Like, what would you, if you were to define what it is that you're looking for an editor now, is it the same as when you started or has anything changed? Um. I think it's pretty much the, the same as when I started. I mean, what you're looking for in an editor is someone who saves you from your own worst self and doesn't cut you any slack whatsoever. And um, it's a hard thing, actually, to experience. I mean, I um, have been very, you know, very, very lucky to have Gary as an editor. You know, he is known to be the most, you know, rigorous and incredible wine editor there is. And, it's funny, I've, I've met and talked with other writers who have, um, who have been edited by him, and we're sort of um, laughing about how you think that you finally learned to write the way that will get you not edited so stringently by Gary. Like, oh, no. like he taught me how to write sentences, and I understand with that first book, you know, okay, you know, I, I maybe didn't know what I was doing, and, and uh, now, I'm, now I know better, and I'm going to write, you know, all beautiful sentences in this, in this new book, and then... Alas, <laughs> he still had plenty to say, you know, and uh, uh, the, the manuscripts come back from, from Gary in the mail, and uh, they smell of cigarettes, and they're covered in green ink, and uh, you sort of look at them, and it goes through like the five stages of grief, you know? <laughs> and it takes me a little while, but then I, I go through, and um, he says it's like a silent conversation. I'm definitely having a very loud conversation in my eyes, like, oh, are you crazy, you know? And, a lot of that, and it's, it's very happy to hear about that. And then at the end, you know, when I get through it, I'm like, man, you really made it better, totter. He saved me a lot of embarrassment, you know. And so even though it's a really kind of difficult process to go through to get called on all of these these things, it's uh, it's so amazing when you get to the end and, and realize that um, it's made the book so so much better. So I mean, that's what I want is someone who doesn't let me get away with that. So you belong to the writer's like, John recovery group. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, mean, I, I point one, out one other thing, which is that it's no exaggeration to say that in writing a novel, the writer is making millions of decisions. Millions. Five million, ten million, you know, pick a number out of thin air, but it is in the million. This word, this comma, this character, I mean, big decisions small decision, the chance that anybody can get many millions of decisions made correctly is obviously impossible. So you're just trying to sort of say, maybe this wasn't quite the right decision, maybe this wasn't quite the way to do it, you know, and, and then get out of the way because it's the right of work. I mean, you know, help somebody finish a book. Writer has to finish the book, but they need, the, you know, there's no law against helping them as best you can. Mm -hmm. So, one more question. Yeah, um, this is a question for both of you. Uh, what are some of your favorite books? And for you, not including Alice's work. That's hard to answer, but there are so, so many. Um, you know, 
great books and my, I think my favorites um, change all, all the time. So I'm just going to talk about my two favorite books of the past six months, <laughs> um, which are um, first, uh, Leaving the Antoja Station by Ben Lerner, which is a book by, by a poet about um, a poet um, about living the poet's life. But it winds up being about so much more. It's really a deeply philosophical um, novel about identity and language, and it's also hilariously funny. I really, really recommend it. Um, and then the other thing that I read recently that I thought was amazing uh, were the Patrick Melrose novels, written by Edward St. Aubin. There's five of them. And they're, again, I mean, very funny at times, incredibly caustic. Um, some of them are, are really depressing, but it's following this one man's life in, in England and um, from his tortured childhood up until um, his life as an adult, sort of sorting through his problems. And it is really an incredible experience sort of akin to, you know, reading a 19th century novel when you spend so much time with this one character over his entire life and become deeply invested in it, and I just think there. Yeah? I, I, I think that was saying, I don't know, is he, um, which is kind of like a perverted disease version of Anthony Powell, thanks to me at the time, a little bit less sprawling, maybe. Um, but they're, they're a great books I fall in love with all the time. Obviously the ones that I publish are a lot. Uh, but you know, the two outside of Shakespeare, the two great books I've written are USC's and the Puppy Dick. Uh, so I would that's my reader. I'll go back and read around in those books because it's not like you're gonna sit down and read it. <laughs> <laughs> How could he ever finish? But, uh, in between, I'm constantly reading books because there's, there's a lot of talent out there in, in all sorts of different areas. You keep trying, and, and I'll read 15, 20 pages of wildly heralded books and sort of say, This isn't for me. Because that's just a fact of things for me. Not everything is for everybody. Um, but looking for what's for you is. That is an obligation to care about 